us your first thoughts on Scripture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of First Thoughts. I have to write it down so I don't forget. I was going to say Monday check-in. I was until maybe about half a second before I actually formed the word. It's because we've all we've done this and we've said Monday check-in like 130 times. And so now we have to change a habit. And what's what's what do they say about changing habits? You have to habit is formed and it takes so many times to change a habit and to mm-hmm. reform. I'm I'm spitballing here. I got nothing. I was once told something having to do with the month of February. So 21 or 27 days or something. And so the month of February worked out to be a good sort of way to, like, to change a habit. Yeah. If you can get through the month of February doing it differently, then you're, then you're pretty well set. Do you think it's going to take us till February to start calling this the uh, first things podcast? Well, it'll take us first February. Thoughts. First thoughts. I didn't even call it the right thing. First Thoughts Podcast. It would take until February three or four years. Well, right. If we were to do 21 times. How many we do? We do essentially well, four a month. In theory, we do about 40 a year. We take a few weeks off in the summer, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So we could, by, by February of 2025, we should stop calling it the yeah. Monday check-in. But I also don't know if... The frequency makes a difference as well, I would imagine, right? Possibly. Because if, you, if you're only doing it once a month, I think I could see it would like maybe take more than whatever, 27 months, 27 right. instances right? in order to change it. Whereas if, you're, if it's a thing that you're doing once a week or every day, then maybe it would take a fewer number of instances to ingrain the... The, the new pattern or the mm-hmm. new habit, yeah. What we have learned through the process of studying the narrative lectionary this fall is that the uh, God's people, the Israelites, the people of Judah, um, have a very difficult time breaking habits and patterns. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we're going to discover that yet again this week, that there is uh, more difficulty of breaking habits and patterns. So... Uh, hopefully, Pastor Damon and I will be better about that than the Israelites were. <laughs> yeah, well, it's you know, it's nice to know that we're not alone. <laughs> That's fair. Solidarity in our <laughs> poor behavior. Yeah, great. Yeah, but, no. uh, not that misnaming this podcast is poor behavior per se. But. <laughs> no, I think that there's right. There's a way of reading these stories and thinking of these are old stories, and not but when really they're very current stories. Indeed, and that was really my right. revelation as I dug more deeply into the passage that I preached on this last week. Was like, no, this is yes, this was an old story about a weird story about a rediscovered scroll, but really, no, this is about us losing our bearings, losing track yeah. of our foundation, and needing to refine it. And it's mm-hmm. it's it's while it may have been an actual historical story it's a phenomenal metaphor for the human yeah. condition whether it was 2000 or 2500 years ago whether it's today right yeah. yep that's very current certainly yeah. so first thoughts uh if people don't know and if they haven't guessed by now already <laughs> what we are going to do is we're going to take a look at the scripture that we're going to use for the upcoming sunday here at first presbyterian church hastings nebraska i don't think we introduced ourselves yet I'm Damon Jensen Heitman, one of the pastors of said church. Greg Allen Pickett, the other pastor at said church. And we'll have a little opening first thoughts Bible study, taking a look at the passage, ask questions of the passage, perhaps, perhaps allow the passage to ask questions of us at the start of the week as well. And we usually begin with an opening prayer, and I think it is your turn. All right. Let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the chance to gather at the beginning of this week and to spend some time in your word. When the words themselves make us scratch our heads, God, we thank you for uh, your willingness to grant us some wisdom, perhaps some patience and grace as we wrestle. 
And above all, God, grant us your love. May we read all of your words through the lens of your love, uh, your love for this world, your love for your people. And in turn, may we seek to embody that love in this world. May we seek to be vessels of your love so that through our life and our living and through our study of your scripture, we can become more like you and do a better job of sharing your love so that people may come to know that they are your beloved children. It's in Jesus' holy and loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. So then, for this upcoming Sunday, which also happens to be the first Sunday in Advent, yes, we have a passage from Jeremiah, and we also have a passage from Mark. Yes. And let's start with the passage from Jeremiah. Um... I'm just I'm gonna read this is Jeremiah 33 14 through 18 and then if we feel that we need more context then we'll we'll fill that in as, yeah. we, as we have questions or as we think about it so Jeremiah 33 14 through 18 reads something like this the days are surely coming says the Lord when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to make grain offerings, and to make sacrifices for all time. And that's where we pause. Greg, what do you, what do you got? <laughs> I think we need some context here. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a messianic prophecy. Uh, we've been wrestling with some of these messianic or messiah prophecies. Uh, two weeks ago, we studied uh, one of the messiah prophecies in Isaiah. We determined that um, more than likely the writer wasn't thinking about Jesus Christ, but also that we as Christians read back into these messianic prophecies, uh, our own understanding and our own worldview and our own understanding of the scriptures and of God and God's work. And so um, I think the same thing is happening here. Uh, but the prophet Jeremiah is, um, well, he's in the midst of a pretty desolate situation. Yeah, this is, this is Babylon, correct? Uh, no, no. This is when he's still within the the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and but it's the Babylonian Empire. This is correct? the Babylonian Empire that is yes, correct. Yeah. We've moved from the Assyrian Empire to the Babylonian. Which we've been, yeah, worried about. Uh, yes. Now, uh, now it's Assyria was sort of the predominant empire of the area, and then they were conquered by the Babylonians. Correct. Right, and so now the Babylonians are are causing problems. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And folks are about to be taken into exile. Well, the group has already been taken into exile, right? At the beginning of Jeremiah, you have the first set taken into exile. Sure. Okay. And Jeremiah stays in Jerusalem. Yeah. And uh, stays there under a uh, Babylonian king who eventually, the king himself rebels from the Babylonian Empire. And so then the Babylonians come back to Jerusalem and lay siege on the city. Sure, they've installed a, a sort of a puppet ruler, uh -huh. a vassal ruler. Great. Yep. Okay. And uh, so this is the second siege of the city of Jerusalem, and it's not going to end well for no. the city or the people there. No. no. Um, and not that's in the midst of this, and the book of Jeremiah is, well, Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet or the wailing prophet, and it's chapter after chapter after chapter of lament. And mm -hmm. trying to remind the people how far they've come from God's ways and how desperately they need to get back to God's ways and the consequences of them not following God. And then we have this little 
itty bitty sliver of hope with this messianic prophecy. <laughs> and it's 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 a little bigger than just uh, verses 14 through 18. I'm going to read 10 and 11 as well, uh, which is a uh, bracketed part of this narrative lectionary. Mm-hmm. And it says, Thus says the Lord, In this place of which you say, It is a waste without human beings or animals in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without inhabitants, human or animal. So this is describing mm-hmm. how terrible it's got. Yeah. And then it says, There shall once more be heard the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. So, but in the meantime, it's going to be rough. Yeah. 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 There's, um, you know, you're mentioning a, 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 a sliver of hope emerging yeah and in this we get uh, a reference to the uh, righteous branch yes spring up for david i put four in a block here because i was curious how that word got translated in other past in other translations i didn't look it up but one of because we came across this the shoot from jesse stump yep and that's isaiah Correct. correct which we studied two weeks ago yep one of the things that I thought about when I was thinking about the shoot from Jesse's stump and that I also kind of think about here, I'm not sure if the branch is for David or from David. I think that makes a difference in some way. But most, if you have a, a tree or a shrub uh-huh. that has been felled yep. and then a shoot comes out of it, Right. That shoot <laughs> is so much weaker and smaller, at least at the start, mm-hmm. um, than what was there beforehand. Yep. And it can look so different. Yep. As well, that that I was just thinking about. It's a it's a hope, but it is such a small and fragile hope, mm-hmm. and and holding sort of both of those things at the same time yeah. is is really interesting. And in that it doesn't the little shoot is not gonna like, if it produces fruit, it's not gonna do so for years, right? <laughs> right, and so and so like the. The reality, it's almost as though the reality of the situation in the present doesn't really change that much. It, But the shoot is very much a promise for the future. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's such an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking about just now, thinking, okay, what then, like, what are the places of desolation that we experience? Right. right? And, and any place of desolation that I experience is not at all going to compare to the reality of the situation as described right. by the prophet Jeremiah and, and the desolation that he was speaking to yep. and into. Um, and I was thinking, what are, very rarely do those sort of places of desolation just change in an instant. Right. But sort of over time, you learn a new way of being or something new emerges and that and sort of over time you are able to make peace with the grief or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Um, and, and live into some sort of new way of being. Um, yeah. So when I came across Branch, and for some reason Branch is capitalized. Yep. Which I think is weird. I don't know <laughs> why. You got the CEB right there. That is. Um, 
And then also, and the the days, it's plural days, which me imply like that's a longer amount of time. Yeah, it will be a, just a new era. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. Yeah, but that it may take some time, right? To do like the, this is gonna. This is a days long process. Yeah, this is not. Um, you know, it's not quick bread. No, it's a long. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I'll find it. Yeah. Jeremiah thirty-three. Fourteen. Thank you. The time is coming. Okay. Declares the Lord, and I will fulfill my gracious promise with the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous lowercase b branch from David's line. Okay. Clarifies that a little bit, I suppose. Who will do what is just and right in the land. Okay. So on and so forth. Uh, the other, and this also offers insight to another question that I had. <laughs> in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is what he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Uh, and this is, this is what it, the name by which it will be called. Right. Which, and so I couldn't figure out, is this referring to, to a specific person, or is this referring to this time frame? Yeah. Well, in the NRSV, obviously, it could be time frame. Yeah. But translators of the Common English Bible saw it more as a personal pronoun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, it could be either, you know. But. Yeah. I think you're onto something, though, though. I... I, I and I don't want to overuse an image, but the, this notion of a, a branch or a sprout springing up from a stump, um, it is a sign of hope, but yet it's, it's hope yet to come, right? Yeah, yeah. And the hope that it's going to... Like, it's going to take work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, the, that sprout or that branch itself is going to have to do work. The leaves on that thing are going to have to do work. The soil is going to have to do work for it. The people around it are going to have to do work. To protect it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to nurture it or protect it or... Right. Just, even just to make sure they don't trample on it accidentally. Right. <laughs> it, like... Which is something I also think about now that we are moving into Advent and thinking about the, the child being born. Mm -hmm. um, and is it, there's, there's a piece of music that's a musical setting of a poem by Howard Thurman, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's The Work of Christmas is yes. the title of it. Yep. That I always think about, like, hope, like, somebody has to raise hope. Like, <laughs> right. Um, which is the title of a, a TV show uh, from, uh, that used to be on Fox. <laughs> raising Hope. Yeah, yeah, Raising Hope. Yeah. But like, somebody's got to nurture this thing and care for it and tend it and teach it how it ought to be in the world. Well, it's a really great metaphor thinking about the, the sprig or the, the branch or the, the twig springing up um, and thinking about the hope of the world resting in a newborn infant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you're talking minimum 15 or 20 years before yeah. that hope. It was, it was like even talking about Josiah as an eight-year-old king last week. Yeah. It, it, not a okay. lot of good an eight-year-old king can do. You <laughs> right. got to invest in that king and hope that at the end of the day, that king comes out right. Um, yeah. And... And yet, yet, that's still hope. Yeah, there's like there is an innate hope there. Yeah, right. That just exists. That just is. Right. Um, and also, that hope has to be nurtured 
and right. supported in some in some way. I like that. Right? Yeah. Even if that hope is just like, you're not going to cry every day for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Even if that is just the hope, like that needs to be nurtured in some way. Right. You know, like somebody needs to like offer you a Kleenex. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. or sit with you in it at some point. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah. Yeah. Well, it was just interesting. I have other questions. <laughs> Shoot, let's do it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I think that we've kind of answered or proposed answers to some of these. In verse 14, I will fulfill the promise that I made. What promise? When did you make this promise? And hopefully this is one of the good promises. Because yeah. there's other promises that are not as good. Yeah, but it, I mean, right. it describes how the promise will be fulfilled, and it is good, I think. It does, but yeah. I don't know. I just wanted... And I understand that we're picking up like right in the middle of a passage. Right. But I wanted some more specificity. <laughs> okay. In that word. Uh, what else? And... In those days and at that time, just sort of the frustration of, could you be more specific, please? Right. Um, and, and folks experiencing a desolation. I think know the frustration of the lack of... I can't tell you when this healing is going to feel complete. Right. Uh, I, I can tell you that it will but I don't know when and yeah. I don't really know the things that are going to happen to make it help it to feel complete this healing. Yeah. And then thinking about that overlaying that over sort of a generational or multi-generational desolation as mm-hmm. well. Right. I think reflecting on it in our own personal lives and desolation we may experience in our lifetime or, or even in a season of our life is, um, is a helpful thing because we can relate to that. Yeah. But also thinking about multiple generations who have experienced repeated and ongoing desolation and how they hold on to hope. Yeah. That's, yeah, that, that, when I did a lot of uh, overseas mission work and would be in places that, felt rather hopeless for a variety of reasons, whether it was conflict or food insecurity or whatever. I would meet these global mission partners uh, who were doing life-sustaining work in the midst of this desolation. And oftentimes I would be so overwhelmed by the challenges that I saw or experienced. And I would watch them continue to do the work um, knowing that it may not have an impact this generation, but maybe the next or the next after that. Yeah. And one of my questions was, where do you see hope in the midst of this? Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I would often feel a sense of hopelessness. Sure. And it was amazing the answers to those questions, but they, it was it would often center on a personal story, uh, some experience they had, or sort of a we're we're in Spanish cosechando para el futuro. We're we're we're, um, we're seeding for the future. Sure, right. We're we're planting the seeds that we know will eventually bring about hope. We may never see it in our lifetime, or or perhaps even the next lifetime, but we know it's it's coming, and we're going to keep at the work because we can we can hold on to that. At hope, mm-hmm. and it's it's a powerful, mm-hmm. powerful thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to think about communities. How do communities um, hold on to hope? Communities that have experienced some sort of devastation, yeah, mm-hmm. or repeated devastations. You know, yeah. some communities. You know, now thinking about communities that have experienced multiple wildfires that have 
you know, or multiple natural disasters or, sure. or multiple human made disasters, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm in my mind. I, I start to think about native American uh-huh. communities. Yeah. Um, and, and the continued generational devastation upon devastation foist, foisted upon them. Right. By others. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And, and we sent a team up, um, oh my gosh, the name Pine Ridge, was Pine Ridge uh, up to Pine Ridge, uh, who met with Henry Red Cloud. And that guy is full of hope for his community, yeah. despite yeah. the generations upon generations of hopelessness that have been foisted upon them. And he's, he's out there doing the work. He's, he's <laughs> tending to the sprig that's springing up from the stump. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, and doing all sorts of projects to try to bring hope to that community. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and so this passage is being partnered with the portion of the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Yes. Um, I assume because it's Advent. One can make that assumption. <laughs> and because it, Pairs well because Jeremiah is a messianic prophecy and Jesus yeah. is having a, a debate mm-hmm. with his uh, disciples about who they, they say that he is. Yeah. Okay. So now you've used the word debate, which is, is interesting for this. I'm going to read it. It's Mark okay. chapter 8, 27. Uh, this is not through 38. It's just 27 and 28. It's, yes. it's two verses in the Gospel of Mark. And it reads like this. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. It was like a region. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. Now, do you see this as as debate? Uh, healthy conversation among friends, maybe? I don't know. I don't I Because that's one of my things, right? Um, I have here, what is Jesus' mood when, he, when Jesus asks this questions? And this first question, how, you know, how do you read that first question? Is Jesus... Curious? Is Jesus looking for ideas of, about how to think of himself? Is he, is Jesus like trying to get feedback? Is my teaching being like, are people getting the right idea right. about me? Um, is it like a quality control sort of a, is, is he setting up the disciples in some way of to, like is like is he testing them in some way to see what's going on? I think that you that question can be read in lots of different different ways. You know, of just like boy, a lot of people are really coming out to hear what I have to say. Right. <laughs> what do you, who do people say that I? am? What are they like? Yeah. Who do you say that I am? <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, like he know. could just be curious. He could be sort of poking a little. You know. Yeah, poking a little bit of like, all right, now it's 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 you've heard this for a while. Now let's start to figure out if you got the right idea or not. Like, right. who do people say that I am? And if we continue, there is an answer. You if know? we continue the passage, yeah. Immediately after that, and then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus uses this as a teaching opportunity. Once they've identified him as the Messiah, he lets them know what that's going to look like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and Peter identifies him. Right. And then... Did the others join in? Do they assent? Because right after this, he tells them not to tell anybody. Right. Right. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah. And this word, okay, so this word also Messiah, 
Mm -hmm. You reference Jeremiah as a messianic prophecy. Right. Peter here says, you to Jesus, you are the Messiah. Right. What is a Messiah? Are you asking me that? <laughs> I mean, I have a definition in my mind. Uh, it's a savior, one who will come to save the people. Is that the definition like of Messiah? The, the, like the technical definition of Messiah? I think so. I always thought it was messenger. Oh. That a Messiah was an, like, an anointed messenger, like anointed with a particular message. No, there's a salvation component to the term And that could be a Messiah. message of salvation. Or maybe that is often a message of God's salvation. Yeah. it's a good question. We need, we need Van Harvey's theological dictionary. Uh, according to Oxford, the first definition is the promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. The second definition is a leader or savior of a particular group or cause. Its origin is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, Mashiach, which is the anointed one. Which is anointed, right. Okay. Yes. So, there you go. So, yeah. An anointed one of God. Yes. And, and generally anointed to a particular purpose. Yes. Right. So when Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, mm -hmm. their context would be the Jewish context. So you are the anointed one. You are the one who will save God's people. Whatever that means. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> There's, like there's um, that was one of the things that stood out to me in this passage was also um, there's a fair number of sort of big religious terms and words that we use fairly often that we don't often define. Um, so in the Jeremiah, like, justice. Okay, what is justice and righteousness? Right is the one that comes up there. The Lord is our righteousness. Uh huh. What does that mean? I mean, like Messiah. Right. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay. Uh -huh. That uh, you know, somebody could play around with if they wanted to. One one could do that. Mm -hmm. Does one want to do that? You oh, I'm not preaching. <laughs> you want to preach? <laughs> <laughs> also, why do they think he's John the Baptist? That's fair. Has John has, like, has John died yet? No, in Mark he doesn't. He just kind of disappears. Oh. <laughs> in I think Math Matthew or Luke, one of them he gets put in prison, and the other one he gets beheaded. Beheaded. I think in Matthew he gets beheaded. I right. think. And Luke, he gets. No, he just. I think uh, you'd have a person would have to go back and. And re read the first eight chapters, which wouldn't take that long. But oh no, wait, wait, wait! I'm wrong. And Mark, he is beheaded. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So are some people thinking that Jesus is a resurrected John the Baptist, or are they thinking that he? Think. I mean, John the Baptist was his cousin. In Luke, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think in Mark, not necessarily. Well, he's baptized by John the Baptist. Right. He is Mark. that. In Mark. <laughs> so, I, it's just, I was just like, what? Why would you? Like, I don't know who baptized you as a child. I, I don't know who, who that person was, okay. right? But if you were to say, like, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people think that you're Reverend John Smith. Like, yeah. What? What? <laughs> Why? 
why would people... And there's obviously like a theological thing going on here. Clearly. Right. But it's just, why <laughs> would you think that? I don't know. You're in a particularly question-raising mood today. Oh, this I, is what I, I do. I, I like it. Yeah. I like, like it. Like, did Jesus, like, did he get John's clothes and start wearing them? Was he wearing camel's hair and yeah. a leather belt around his waist? Because Elijah gets mentioned there, too. Right? I don't know. And Elijah, and there's a connection there between Elijah and John the Baptizer. Mm-hmm. So maybe Jesus is, maybe we've incorrectly put Jesus in a robe all this time where he should have been wearing a cloak <laughs> yeah, of camel hair. Maybe. I mean, I'm going to assume that has something to do with the preaching about the uh, repentance, the need for repentance. Could be. Or or, or the way he dressed. But that's you what just don't know. But that's what folks <laughs> Who do are... people say that? Well, you keep dressing like John the Baptizer and Elijah, so, so that's what some people... I yeah, I guess you're John the John Or you the keep Baptist. talking about the things that John and Elijah said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's just one, you know, any one of the prophets. It could be yeah. any one of the prophets. It kind of makes a difference which one, I think. But Yeah. I don't know. All right. Anything Sh- else? Surely there's something amongst all those questions you've raised that could preach, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. I think it could preach. So, is that all that we have to say about that? I, I think so. That's all that we have to say about that. But I'm bummed. Moving on? Yeah. Okay, switching gears. Okay. What else? What's what's going on? What should people be aware of? I think, uh, let's see. Well, we uh, we have our worship schedule, 8.30 contemplative service, 10.30 traditional service. Uh, this Sunday will be the first Sunday of the season of Lent, as well as, uh, nope. uh, excuse me, Advent. <laughs> it doesn't help that both words end with E-N-T. Mm, yeah. Um, and, uh, it will also be a communion Sunday. Then that raises an That's interesting true. question of what color pyramids do we put on? We get to put the purple pyramids up for four weeks, but it's two half and half. Let's, uh, let's put the white pyramid on the communion table, but the purple, the purple, purple, the purple one on the pulpit. Okay. What color is the one that gets paraded in? Uh, Those like vary in color, don't they? I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Some of them are like I think a they're white, bronze-ish kind of a thing. Yeah. And one of them's red, isn't it? <sighs> Maybe. Hmm. I guess my ultimate answer is that it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> I don't think. Maybe I'm. I could be wrong. All right, so that's our worship schedule. We took a Sunday off from uh, Sunday school, but we're back on this week at 9.15, Sunday school for all ages, including an adult ed forum. Tell us about that forum. Hannah Jensen Heitman is the um, author, composer of a piece of, a piece of work. It's a real piece of work. Uh, it's, it's a cantata. It's an Advent cantata. It's called The Bears of the Divine. It will be world premiering at First Presbyterian Church on December 10th. And she is, during forum, passing along some more information uh, related to that forum. So sharing some of the music from it, talking a little bit about um, the the the. I think the process as a whole of writing the cantata, the process of each particular song as well, and just and filling in some more details for folks related to that. So that is what she is doing at Forum this coming Sunday. That's Sunday, December 3rd at 9.15 in the Lydia Room, as well as Sunday School for All Ages. Uh, but before that, we have two really exciting events coming up this week. Right on Friday, mm-hmm. we have a um, trivia night and chili supper. Yeah, and that's a fundraiser for the Food for Thought uh, program, which is a mission or ministry of Hastings College uh, to ensure that people don't go hungry. Yeah, right? they they pack backpacks uh, with food for school children. 
um, to take home, particularly over the weekends. And holidays. And holidays. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, come on down to the church at 6 o'clock on Friday night. Enjoy a bowl of chili, play some trivia, and raise some money for an important program. And then on Saturday, December the 2nd, we're very excited to have a family advent craft event. Yeah. I believe that starts at 10 a.m. Yep. It'll be in the fellowship hall. There will be at least four stations set up for different crafts that children can make. And these crafts will, in our opinion, be a high enough quality that they can be given as a gift. So the children can be part of making a gift for their family members for Christmas. Uh, Mm -hmm. So come on down for that as well. Yeah. It will be very good. Then it's sort of regular, excuse me, Advent things until we get to Christmas Eve, which is on a Sunday this year. Indeed. And so that means we're going to skip our early contemplative service at 830 We're also not going to have any Christian ed that day. So we'll have one worship service uh, on Sunday morning at 1030. It'll be a modified lessons and carols service. Just anybody named Carol, just come up to the front. We'll give you a part. We'll give you a lesson, Mm -hmm. you know, to read or to teach. And and that'll be it. We'll have lessons and carols. Yes. And then we will have... uh, We may have to recruit some more carols. (laughs) We'll have uh, our have normal... carols in the congregation? We do. Carol Storer. Oh, yes. She's, she, we, guess we need more. We need more carols. Okay. I'll work on it. Okay. Get the evangelism committee on that. <laughs> yeah. Get congregational life. That'll be at the top of the next carols. agenda. <laughs> All right. Then we'll have our normal Christmas Eve service lineup. Uh, so we'll do a 2 o'clock service out at College View, we'll do a 5.30 family-oriented service, a 7.30 traditional service, and an 11 o'clock contemplative Vespers service for Christmas Eve. So you'll want to join us for that. All of it. Mm-hmm. Either Dana or I will be at every single one of those services. Fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. So. Is that it then? I think that's all we got. Okay. We should do a closing prayer. I think that's... That's and right. also, we should, in the future, remember to do a closing prayer at the end of the first segment. Of the Bible study. Yeah. Before we roll into announcements. Yeah. That makes that's, sense. We should move the closing prayer to then. It sounds like a good first thoughts yeah. thing. All right. Well, yeah. in the future. Let's do it now, though, for sure. Okay. okay let's pray. Loving and gracious God, uh, we know that you are forgiveness we know that you are mercy we know that you are grace and truth and we know that you are hope and that it is through you that we find our way through devastations and through desolations thank you O god for the shoots for the branches for all of those things that have helped to sustain us in our times of need Help us, O God, in ways large or in ways small, to be those sorts of things for others as well. Help us, O God, as we move throughout the rest of the week to look for places where we can bring a sort of and a type of your peace into the world. In your gracious and loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well then, with all those things said and done, until next time, toodaloo.